We'll be speaking today about a resolution about Palestinians approved by the National Association of the Religious Group, the Unitarian Universalists. I'll be speaking to Dana Ashrawi, who is the who is on the coordinating team for the Action of Immediate Witness and president of the Unitarian Universalist for Justice in the Middle East. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's it's Dana like banana. I'm sorry, Dana. That's okay. <laughs> Before we get into the details, what were some of the let's call them bullet points about the association, the association's resolution on Palestine? It's a call to action. It's not a resolution in the sense of a business resolution, which mandates action on the part of the administration of the association. But it called for a, a various kinds of action. It called for Unitarian Universalists to witness the horrors of what is going on in Gaza. It calls on Unitarian Universalist organizations and congregations to come out and public in favor of a ceasefire, which would also mean the release of hostages. You can't release captives without a ceasefire. It calls on uh, the how of statements that the UUA has already made for ceasefire and ending military aid to the state of Israel. And the how, in our view as a coalition that passed this, is that we all need to be engaged in boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the state of Israel and its enablers until the state follows international law. And it also calls for creation of sacred spaces for processing the situation, for teach-ins, for listening circles, and it calls for the release of all captives. Wow. It also so importantly calls on UU groups and congregations to sign the apartheid free pledge, which was initiated by the American Friends Service Committee in 2023. Right, maybe we can get into that a little bit later, but it's uh, quite a comprehensive and uh, strong uh, action or act of immediate witness. So first, let me go into some uh, background. So how many congregations are affiliated with the, the UU Association? About a thousand congregations. And there was an interesting report that came out sometime in the past year that said that while there might be about 100,000 Unitarian Universalists officially members of congregations in North America, there might be 500,000 people that identify as Unitarian Universalists but are not members of a congregation. So it's a small movement, but it's it's bigger than some people realize. Well, it sounds very substantial to me. So uh, about this General Assembly that decides the... Uh, the path forward for the association. Uh, it was it was virtual, as I understand. Yes, many yes. Delegates they, attended that way. I'm not sure how many. Well, yeah, they were all virtual, but uh, 2,700 or so delegates attended, and there were 3,400 attendees altogether because people can attend so that they can see different proceedings and, and go to workshops to, you know, enrich the knowledge of their congregations. But yes, there were 2,700 credential delegates from more than 700 congregations in 50 states, all 50 states, and Washington, D.C., Canada, the Virgin Islands, Mexico, France, and the Philippines. Wow, impressive. Now, you talked about it a little bit before, but what exactly is an act of immediate witness? This is a statement about something significant that is happening in the world immediately before or during the General Assembly. Sometimes an action of immediate witness can be drafted right before the General Assembly, up to maybe a couple of days before for a virtual assembly, because things come up in the world, justice situations emerge, and, and you use might feel called to say something about it. But this one, of course, we all in our coalition were hoping it would end before General Assembly, but it didn't. And uh, the commission that, that looks at the proposed AIWs determined that it was still relevant because it was it's still happening. The, uh, the, uh, the violent assault on Gaza is, continues even after General Assembly. So that's what an AIW is, and it calls on um, calls for action. And uh, unlike uh, 
some conventions well there are they adopt uh, scores of resolution the, there were only three uh, AIWs correct correct and uh, I've been involved in supporting as you say scores of resolutions by other denominations where you can have an unlimited number of proposals and they could theoretically all be under consideration but yes, in, in the Uni Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly rules, you can only have three actions of immediate witness, which is frustrating to a lot of people because there are so many worthy causes out there. And when you when you limit it to three, then you you run the risk of competing with other worthy causes. So, but in this case, there were only three proposed that were deemed worthy of the commission. There were several others proposed, but they were uh, not included because either they talked about something that had already been adopted by delegates in the recent past, or they really just didn't fit the requirements for an action of immediate witness. So we were automatically going to be considered for adding to the agenda. So talking about some of the details in the act of immediate witness, I sort of cut you off a little early uh, earlier, I wanted to get back to it and, uh, you know, get into other things. But I mean, calling for boycott, calling for a, 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 an end to military aid, I think it was. Those are quite uh, bold actions, bold proposals. Yeah. Um, and there we were underscoring what the UUA senior leadership has called for in the months before General Assembly. They had called for a ceasefire back in October, along with numerous other UU justice groups. And in February, they put out, and by they, I mean, it's the president and the vice presidents of the UUA that make these press releases and statements. They were calling for an end to military aid to the state of Israel until this stops. So we felt like we had grounding to at least say that and push for more, which is how do we get there? As I said before, and we all agreed that it's boycott, divestment, and sanctions. How do, how else do you put pressure on somebody to change? And it's it's a nonviolent method that has been used for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and we we felt like the apartheid free communities pledge is a way for congregations and UU groups to learn more about the how. How do you put that pressure? And so that's why we put those calls in there. And what we also the felt, I'm sorry, finish. We right. also felt as a, a faith organization that it's important to do some spiritual processing. So, for example, a group called DRUM, which was part of the coalition, which stands for Diverse and Revolutionary UU Multicultural Ministries uh, and represents people of color in our faith, they started producing vigils for Gaza back in October, um, which is a very important spiritual space for learning and just going through the grieving and lament process. And really at the start, you were talking about uh, the uh, pledge about uh, living in an apartheid free community. So what mm -hmm. is involved with that pledge? It's an aspirational pledge because nobody's going to be completely disentangled from supporting the apartheid that is going on in Israel from the river to the sea, whether it's the military occupation where there's two separate sets of laws and roads and identity cards and license plates, or whether in 1948 Israel where there are 60 laws that discriminate against non-Jews. So the apartheid free pledge is a, a community that you can join and you can learn more about the situation, that, and not just apartheid, also the military occupation and the, the settler displacing movement that continues to take land and build settlements today, which have just been declared illegal by the United Nations International Court of Justice. So um, there's toolkits on the apartheid free website where you can learn who you can boycott, what you can divest from, and ideas like put a banner in front of your congregation saying that you're an apartheid free community or a poster in your window. And it could be something as simple as maybe the congregation is ready to buy a new printer for the office and you find out from the BDS movement, which is Palestinian led, what are the companies that should be boycotted under a targeted boycott approach? 
And Hewlett Packard is one of those companies. That's going to so make maybe, it HP. Maybe you find another manufacturer for your printer. Um, another campaign that started recently is specifically related to the genocide, which is uh, boycotting Chevron because they are providing fuel for the, the military and uh, also are maybe involved in some of the natural gas extraction in the Mediterranean, which legally belongs to the Palestinians, but is being taken from them. So those are just some suggestions. Oh, good ones. Uh, so the resolution was uh, adopted overwhelmingly, but there was also, um, or I, sh I shouldn't call it a resolution, act of immediate witness. But then there was something seemed to me like a re special action, let's call it, uh, about Israelis captured by Hamas and other Palestinian forces. What was that? This is a kind of UU resolution called a responsive resolution. And uh, the rules are that it has to be in response to a report delivered during a general assembly. Um, this responsive resolution responded to the president's report, which included statements about the tragedy in Gaza and the, the fate of the hostages being held there. Now, it's pretty terrible, you know, about 120, I guess, are uh, are still held. Uh, what uh, was there in this uh, response? Was there mention of all these Palestinians that the Israelis grabbed on the West Bank, thousands of perhaps to use as pawns in negotiations? Uh, the response of resolution did not mention Palestinian captives. There, the focus was on Israeli Jews being held in Gaza, which, yes, as you mentioned, it's it's terrible. It's against international law for this to be happening. Um, the AIW on solidarity with Palestinians called for the release of all captives. We were focusing on collective liberation for everyone. And by this, we meant the Israeli Jews held it captive in Gaza, as well as the now, I think, more than 10,000 Palestinians held captive by the Israeli state. Now, you mentioned a couple of the groups involved in drawing up the AIW. Could you maybe elaborate on that? Yes, the AIW collective included um, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, Diverse Revolutionary UU Multicultural Ministries, UUs for Justice in the Middle East, UU Refugee and Immigrant Services and Education, and the UU Peace Ministry Network, as well as UUs for a Just Economic Community. And the proposers were Reverend D.L. Helfer, a Jewish UU, Lena Gardner, who is the executive director of Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, and the Reverend Katie Romano Griffin, senior minister at All Souls in Indianapolis, and the Reverend Abi Janamanchi, a co-founder of the UU Ministry for People of Color, DRUM. And uh, we extensively sought input on the wording from people with identities from the region, meaning uh, SWANA UUs, which stands for Southwest Asia, North Africa, Arab UUs, Jewish UUs, people of color, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, other faith identities. And we had quite a few UUs of Jewish heritage that supported and officially endorsed the AIW. Also, there are some Palestinian UUs out there, and they definitely had input into the, the content and the advising of the, of the draft. Good. Uh, as we call... a uh... Getting near the close of the interview, could I ask you about your own personal interest uh, in this issue of justice for Palestine? Uh, when did that start? I think I can trace it back to my childhood. <laughs> I think I was raised with UU principles and values. My, my father grew up Unitarian before the merger. He was born back in the 20s. His mother, when they were living in Illinois, they attended a church that had this old Unitarian verse in it that people will recognize and we adapted it for our family grace love is the spirit of this home and service is its law to dwell together in peace to seek the truth and love and to help one another and we lived it I remember in third grade I came home from school with an ethnic joke against Italian immigrants and I told it to my mother who listened with a very straight face the child of Polish immigrants <laughs> and said to me she made it a beautiful teaching moment Dana in our family, we don't make fun of people because of where they come from. 
And she went on and told me the story of being the child of Polish immigrants and going to school and not speaking English and being mocked. And it made such an impression on me. She, she didn't humiliate me. She taught me with love. And she opened my eyes and my heart to the dignity of others. And I think that just, just really shaped a lot of who I was. And then in college, I had a Jewish friend whose family introduced me to Palestinians. And he had a, a professor that was Lebanese and her, their daughter had married a Palestinian. So we went to sort of salons at that house once a month. And I learned a lot from that. And then I ended up marrying a Palestinian. Uh -huh. And we had three children together. So of course I learned a lot through this relationship <laughs> and the community that I became a part of. But I, like I said, I think it, it stems from my my upbringing and my, my UU values. Well, let's close with uh, what's the next step? Um, will there be flyers? And uh, You mentioned some websites, and we can link to all of that. Um, but what, what are some of the things that associations can do to carry out the AIW? Well, I'm so glad you asked. There's a lot that can be done. And as mentioned, this is not uh, a resolution of the type that mandates that the UUA must do something, but their heart is already in the right direction. And our coalition is planning to meet with them soon to discuss some more specifics of what they might do to support. But the association has already provided a rich web page of resources with um, If you Google why we cannot turn away UUA, you'll find, and I'll send you the link, this page that has a, a webinar featuring six UU ministers with heritage from the region, a resources guide, a template for listening circles, all very valuable resources. And the webinar itself includes messages from two Palestinian faith leaders and an Israeli Jewish solidarity activist. So I think one thing to do is to promote use of these resources in every congregation. Um, and also, we already provided five webinars before General Assembly on related topics, and those will be found on our, our website soon, uujme.org. We received a huge grant from the UU Program Fund to provide education and organizing. So we've hired a part-time organizer to help build and increase the number of chapters of UUJME across the country. We already have a presence in more than 30 locations and we'd like to have more because it's a way for people to learn, gather in community and figure out how to take action and perhaps advance the apartheid free pledge signatures. So um, we're, we're planning to launch a, a postcard campaign where we'll be mailing out to all the congregations in North America, a series of learning and action spaces uh, supported by this coalition that put together the AIW. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to providing those spaces soon. We're also hoping to work with some individuals in the coalition that want to uh, provide some training in something called um, circle process, which is based on sociocracy, a kind of democratic consensus building philosophy, which we, we hope will support people learning how to converse about this, to go beyond just listening and to, to discern what actions can be taken in a congregation. And we want to fund people attending the, the new Mosaic facilitator training module that's available online and helps people learn how to provide education on anti-racism and anti-oppression without harming the people that are, that are in these uh, training and webinar opportunities. Very comp comprehensive. Dana Ashrawi, I want to thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Stan, for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thank you.